I think it's absolutely crucial for the sustainability of the individual and our planet that uh, we raise the level of conscious awareness in human beings. That ability to be self-led. I became involved and interested many years ago in human beings and why we do what we do. Uh, I was fascinated in two things. One, leadership and what leadership means and how you become a really effective leader and release the creative dynamic of everybody who works in the organization. Um, this impetus came from working with, as a very young person, with several people who I felt didn't do that. They didn't seem to have the knack of getting that creativity and spark from people that would allow the, in, the whole organization to really take off in, in, in every way, in, in social capital, in profit, in, in everything. So I became fascinated in uh, how, how you could be a really incredible leader. Um, that was the first thing. Secondly, because I was involved in, in education as a, a head teacher, I was appointed as a head teacher at a very young age. I was 26 and a half when I first became a head teacher. And I noticed, even in those days, that children were coming into the school without a, an understanding of a basic vocabulary of what we now know as values. They didn't really understand what a word like respect or trust or responsibility, um, empathy, really, really meant. And uh, I started very early on to begin to mull these sort of questions over. How can you be a good leader? And, and what does that really mean in an organization? And uh, I went on to be the head teacher of a very large school. And subsequently to that, I started to run education authorities um, by being a chief advisor, chief officer. And so uh, I had access to huge organizations. Um, I also was fascinated by the research from companies. This is going back into the into the 90s uh, when Hay Mac Bear said that uh, people who run schools are really uh, fulfilling a responsibility and a, a role that few in industry or commerce would actually do because there isn't that facility for delegating responsibility. You, you're just so many different roles all wrapped up into one. So to, if you're a successful head teacher, you probably would be a successful business leader. I've never put that to the test, but uh, it's an interesting proposition. Um, so being a leader, uh, what did that mean to me? I was uh, fascinated to watch people who I felt weren't uh, really allowing people to, to flourish. Um, I believe our aim should always be in an organization, whatever organization, how can you ensure both the organization flourishes overall, but how does each person within the organization flourish? I have always believed in uh, appointing the very best people I can appoint. And once uh, having appointed them, then I have believed in allowing them to have their head, to work within the parameters and definitions that we might create of, as an organization, so everybody knows where we're going, but actually to allow everybody to, to run. And that then means that uh, the well-being of both the company and the individuals uh, really flows. Uh, I think that now, in 2018, we have a severe crisis in society. And the crisis is about individual well-being. Um, again, in, an inter in uh, a context of education, we now know that a quarter of all 14-year-old girls are in some form of self-harming. We can argue why, but it's uh, multifarious, the answer to that. It's partly social, media, uh, family life, 
and the imposition of a draconian set of, of standards in education, which creates a pressure and stress on people, which actually works in the opposite direction to what it's meant. So, um, to actually, I think at the heart of any organization, whatever it is, has to be now for the, the remainder of this century a focus on, on well being in all that form. Um, I can explain a little bit more about that and how we, we tackle that. I believe that human beings are meant to be authentically them. If you allow someone to be authentically themselves, then you get the best out of that person. That person gives the best to their social life and family life if they have one. And they are happy. And we could define what I mean by happy if you want. If you don't have that, what you find is that people are led in their lives by what I would define as a self-like part. So it's not their authentic self. So we learn very early on as we grow up to adapt to situations. If we're in an abusive home, we have to learn how to survive. So the personality uh, that develops is a sub-personality, it's not our real self. And what we are finding now, I believe in society, that so many of us, and perhaps myself included, um, are not being authentically themselves. They are, they are a shadow, they're a, a sub-personality. And all of us naturally have different roles. Some of you listening may be fathers, uh, you may have other jobs, you may play in the football team, you may be, you know, belong to a social group if you're a woman in some way. There's a so, so many roles that we play in society, so we're all used to adapting our personality. But what I feel, because of this crisis, that we are really not being ourselves. And the main driver in 2018, Britain, is a four-letter word, and the four-letter word is fear. Everybody is really fearful, and this is a generalization obviously, but from my experience of the educational world, uh, people are fearful, and therefore they are driven in their organization to make decisions which may not be the best for the organization, but they are making them because they're fearful of external control. One of the things, um, from what you've said so far, that kind of stands out to me is the importance of having the language of values in order to be able to understand uh, how to articulate and to express an issue or a problem, mm. how to talk about a, um, a, 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 the organisation's culture and, and so on. Yes. Um, it sounds like the right vocabulary of values is a way to as it's mm. provides the keys yeah. um, in effect to be able to start having those conversations about mm. what the right values mm. for the organization should be mm. to achieve the kind of culture that allows people mm. to be the best yes. they can be. It may be helpful for me, to, for me to articulate how we would work with a school or a group of schools in order to embed values in the organization <clears throat> and listeners may be able to um, make parallels in their context. The school context obviously isn't a business one but I think there are parallels and lessons to be learned. Um, so in a school context what you avoid doing is telling the community what values they should be learning. So you have what we call a community forum, whereby you invite all stakeholders to come to the school and to contribute to what they believe the values are that their children should be exposed to, to how they should be developed. Now in my experience, in numerous countries, and I work throughout the world, Going through that exercise, empowering the community to speak, leads to a very similar list of values. That, uh, when I first did it, 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 I thought I was going to get 
all sorts of values which I would name as limiting values coming up. Uh, but they didn't. It was all what we term as universal positive human values. Universal because all human beings will buy into them, including all the major religions or the humanist society. Or, they always say these are our values. So that's articulating a shared set of values. It's articulating Which that, is yes. really the core or the foundation of what you're of the culture That's of the organization right. yeah. that 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 is right so every but the important thing is everybody has ownership of it it's not given out from on high it's not the directors of a company saying these are our five values and they're put on the wall of their their organization because we can all write values out but that's not the point yeah they've got to be lived not written on a wall uh, yes and that's the difficult part um, I always say that I'm not a perfect human being. Um, my wife would be able to tell you all sorts of flaws I have. And the danger with values is that people think that, uh, oh, you're setting up a, a, a gold standard that's unachievable. Values is a journey. They are guides, they're signposts that help you to develop dispositions which Aristotle termed as virtues. When a value is actually seen as a part of a person, it becomes a part of their, their virtues, which in modern day parlance is called character traits. So you can see their character traits. So going back to my model, so once the, the, the organization has identified the values, which I say are universal positive human values, then it can say, well, these are our values. In a school setting, we look for um, a variety of words, not just three or four, because what we are doing with the pupils or students is developing what I term an ethical vocabulary. Uh, earlier in the interview, I talked about how children were coming to school without that those a knowledge of the words. So you have to give them sufficient number of words in order to think about and experience. Notice I use the word experience. This isn't teaching values. There's a great debate about whether values can be taught or caught. Um, I think you can talk about values, but from my experience, Children learn about values by being involved in real activities, real situations in which they have to deeply think. And that with older children, uh, then you invite... But they need the language in order to be able to exempt. speak about what they've That's learned. Right. Yeah. They need that language, yeah. which then gives them something that I've termed uh, ethical intelligence. Ethical intelligence uh, is that ability, and a subset of it is emotional intelligence. But ethical intelligence for me is the most important intelligence for the 21st century because it allows you to have attunement with another human being. Going back to what I was saying about us all being, not having enough well-being, I believe human beings find it very difficult to attune to each other now. And there's all sorts of reasons. Social media doesn't help. We can attune to our iPhone. We can attune to our computer because it doesn't answer back. But give us the setting of another human being. Increasingly in society, people are finding that challenging because the ability to have situations where you can attune are becoming less and less. But the ethical vocabulary, which gives you ethical intelligence, begins to help you to understand that. Now, can I unpack some of the reasons for that? Because people watching and listening may be wondering, well, what's going on here? What we've learned over the last 15 years, which has helped us really think deeply about all this, has been uh, the impact of uh, a branch of science called interpersonal neurobiology. Uh, Dr. Dan Siegel uh, is the leading authority People like Louis Cossolino is also another. And there are a variety of neuroscientists who have helped us in education really understand about the internal world of the brain. And that's why I encourage schools to teach children about their brains and their, 
how their brain works, and particularly the function of the prefrontal cortex, which is the area of the brain here. It was the last part of the brain to be laid down in evolutionary terms, and it gives you that executive function to be self-aware. If you're unlucky enough to have a road accident, that part of the brain can be affected, and that's how we know what functions they have. What we now realize in a values-based school, which is what I promote, is that that executive function of the prefrontal cortex is strengthened. Why? Because it helps, it helps us to have a greater clarity and a greater control of ourselves so that we become more self-led. So having the vocabulary of values is like the energy that enables the brain to really reflect about itself and our self as a human being, so that we are more in control. Um, and that's what I mean by self-leadership. And presumably without the ability to do that, the alternative is the, the child or the employee becomes disengaged because yes. they can't participate properly. That's right, yes. So the organization, once you have your vocabulary, uh, demands one thing. And this is the difficult one. You can have a set of values. You can even decide what behaviors you're going to, to follow because you've got those values. Because it's important for the organization to say, well, this is our culture. Let's audit our culture. Is it relevant now for where we are? Um, so you audit your culture. And there are some things you have to jettison. Um, but you have to then think very deeply about how, what, how you're going to create a culture that is values-based. Uh, how are those values going to look actually in practice? And is, it occurs to me that perhaps empathy is the link between emotional intelligence and ethical intelligence. Is that, d does that work? That is a really a, a good point you're making. I'm sure you are right. Empathy, um, the ability to walk in someone else's shoes, being uh, sensitive to somebody else, but maintaining your own integrity at the same time, is a key skill that leads to attunement. Yeah. It's interesting because I hadn't really thought about the similarities between the workplace and the school before we mm -hmm. met, but. Arguably the teacher is a leader, mm -hmm. and arguably the, the good teachers are more like coaches. Yes. Um, and so are the good leaders in organizations more like coaches. Yes. So there's lots of similarities there, and a good coach uh, has got empathy. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of bringing lots of bits of a jigsaw together in an mm -hmm. understanding of really how to build upon an understanding and a vocabulary of values yes. and bring that to life. Yes. There are other elements, though, uh, Paul, within this, and that is uh, uh, from my leadership perspective, uh, leading local authority organizations and large schools, that I have an expression uh, which is there should never be a hierarchy of relationships, only a hierarchy of roles. The organizations that I find are the least effective are those that hide behind a hierarchy of relationships. So you have the organization where the boss has to show he's the boss because he has a big desk, he has the biggest car, he has the prestigious parking place, and everybody feels subservient. When you walk into the organization, his or her picture will be at the top of the list. And as you look down the list, the person with the least status is at the bottom. That is an organization that has a hierarchy of relationships. In the best organizations, whether they're schools or in industry or commerce, that I find, you don't have hierarchy of relationships, only of roles. So everybody is very clear about the role they play in the organization, but they don't feel either superior or inferior to another human beings. Sadly, I think I worked with a big 
uh, company that I won't name of the film, uh, a really big company in this country, not a school, and I was working with mis middle managers. They felt so disempowered from the uh, leadership of the company. They were expected to uh, implement the policies of the people, up, but they felt that they were subservient in relationship terms to those people above them. So they didn't buy into the company. They didn't buy into the values. Uh, they couldn't understand why their leaders were not present on the day. They were isolated. So a good example of uh, hierarchy of relationships. So some would argue, well, in a really big organization, big company, how do you achieve this? Um, I think it can be done. Visibility is one, one way of doing it, being highly visible as leaders. A tip that I was told as a very young head teacher is not to have important meetings in my office all day, to be actually seen by everyone in the organization. Uh, people say, oh, we're too busy for that, you know, but if you really want a real organization that's buzzing with uh, energy, then as a leader, or leaders, because obviously there are lots, you, you make your presence felt. But that presence is a, uh, a values-based presence. It's not the presence that's judgmental. So many traditional leaders will struggle with the idea around um, value. Um, the conversation you know, we've had so far, I think, in the sense that for them, they use a mechanistic analogy to think about the organisation that originates from the idea of scientific management, that mm -hmm. management can be, well, an organisation can be managed like a machine. Mm -hmm. It can, I think it derives from a desire for a, a sense of control. Yeah. Um, we would never apply a mechanistic analogy to the school. We see that as a social system. Uh, so really, actually, we should recognise that both are social systems. And if we did that, then we might understand yeah. better the, the importance of values. Yes. One of my challenges when I talk to uh, people in power is that I feel that our education system has strayed into being a business model. And therefore, people in education, some of our leaders, are not seeing it as a social uh, uh, resource. They're seeing it somewhat differently now. And that worries me deeply because uh, it changes the whole nature of the organisation. So rather than business become more like education, we're making the mistake of making education more like business. How business was. I don't yeah. think it's how business, the businesses that are really forward thinking and think about their social impact and how they release human capital to it. You know, those sort of businesses are, are, are really in the forefront of thinking about sustainable ways of working. Uh, so, but the old model, you're quite right, was mechanistic. It was management. Now, I'm interested in leadership. I think management is a subset of that. Uh, and it, it's, it, it's, but many leaders think they're about management, which they're not, in my view. And what about the impact of rewards and incentives um, in the workplace? We wouldn't use many of the same systems in, in schools that we use in the workplace because they produce the, the, the wrong kind of values and outcomes in children. Hmm. Um, I'm hoping through the work that I'm doing in schools and uh, really getting uh, teachers and students to think about values very deeply, that that will change gradually in business. I, I've invested 30 years in a bottom-up approach. I've been leading a quiet revolution out there. Uh, I, when I started this, I was criticized heavily by people saying, that's not the way to do it. You start with people in power and get them in, interested and let them implement. But I said, no, I don't think a movement of social change happens in that way. So I've put in enormous effort with, with a lot of colleagues, because I'm not alone, <laughs> And we have had an incredible and increasing impact on the educational world, not only in this country, but elsewhere. So that now, 
leaders are beginning to take notice. Why? Because the school communities, that's the parents and governors of schools, are beginning to say, we want to do things differently. I was in a school yesterday, which was an independent school. And that in independent school is now focusing its work on creativity and the arts. There's a thing in this country that the only thing worth doing is maths and uh, literacy and a bit of science thrown in. Uh, but people now are realizing that companies, uh, business, need various skills, which used to be called soft skills. But I don't know what people are thinking listening to this, but from what others tell me, the competencies that are needed now are things like communicative competence, the ability to talk like I'm doing, and be uh, able to do that in a convincing way. Um, passing an exam does not give you communicative competence. Being in a debating society, uh, being asked to stand up and co-teach with another student, uh, being able to articulate what's going on, being involved in drama and theatre, uh, is the way to develop communicative competence. Um, so. You're going to say. There's an, you use one interesting word, which I um, mean, what you've just said as well, which is power. Um, mm. It seems to me that people are very confused about what power is and where it comes from. Yes. Um, and we've all been through schools, so we also mm. know that teachers sometimes mm. abuse power mm. and, and, and don't understand mm. how to have real influence. Because mm. th there's the connection between influence and power and we mm. want power in order to be able to influence but we need to do that in the right way not the wrong way yes. is that yes. is does is power an issue that you've explored um, thought about it deeply um, it's interesting when you say we've all been to school i found that an incredible problem during my career because if you're speaking to any parent when you're talking to them about education they are thinking in their own mind, their own limited experience of their schooling. So if you've been to Eton, you will think I'm talking about the methodologies of Eton. If, if, if you've been to a comprehensive school, you'll think of that. So you contextualize education from your own experience. Always that experience is 30 years out of date or about that. So I think that's true, but even so, there will have been some teachers that we feel positively influenced yeah. us, and those with a more autocratic yeah. style probably negatively influenced yeah. us. Absolutely. We've got a big job to do in all organisations. I'm not pretending that all teachers are values-based. It's where The teaching profession has thousands of people involved in any of the organisations of your colleagues who are listening to me today. There will be people that are more susceptible because of their personality than others. So one of the aspects of values education uh, that I advise head teachers is about looking, once you have those values words, you have to think, how do they look, what do they look like in our culture? Now, in that discussion, you will find that you will have a percentage of colleagues who are not going to go with you. Let me give you an example. If you follow values, you will, the value that is always talked about in England more than any other value is the value of respect. Now, if you have the value of respect in your organisation, what does it look like? Now, in a school context, let's take a secondary school. Can you have the word respect if you have members of staff who will lose it and shout at students. In my book, you can't. So a, a, a teacher who says, no, I've always shouted at the children, it's never harmed them at all, which is <laughs> one of the things that is said. In my view, they're probably better off finding another job. And I'm quite strong on that one. And that's only a very small percentage of the working force. But you'll, you will find some, and in all organisations, some people probably will be happier if they're not in that, the culture of values-based education. And closely linked to the concept of respect, I think, is um, dignity. Mm. So yes. we don't normally use the word dignity in a school context necessarily, or certainly not as a pupil. 
But as an employee, we we want dignity, mm. and that's not often what we feel we get in a working situation. Mm. Yes, I'm just wondering why, why the organisation doesn't think about dignity. In a school context, we would think about quality. Uh, we would think about fairness, justice, um, how you encourage those qualities in people. So um, it would be something that the, the organisation would need to really think deeply about and how they, they would adjust that. But the crucial thing is the leader. The leader has to be prepared to hold up the mirror to themselves. Are they able to get uh, honest feedback? You know, there's some politicians in the world at the moment that find feedback, whether it's from the press, they will dismiss it because they're not able to have enough, uh, enough strength inside that will allow them to, uh, to be open to criticism. So one of the qualities of leadership is that ability to receive creative criticism yourself um, so that you're able then to really know yourself because a leader has, if you're going to be effective, you have to really know your strengths and your weaknesses and if you've got weaknesses and you compensate that for in or so variety that's where of consciousness ways. starts. And that's where consciousness starts. So growing consciousness is is absolutely key. Mm. So th in the experience you've had in education sector now you've got a lot of history of you know good results. Can you explain what some of those results have been? Because some of them I think you would said were beyond your expectations as well in terms of yeah. impact beyond, outside the school as mm. well. Yes, uh, we've worked in a lot of countries of the world. Uh, Newcastle University in Australia was given uh, $250,000 to research the impact of values work um, in Australia. And they produced some really interesting results. Um, for instance, values awareness goes up if you create a values-based context. People become more just aware of them and therefore are more inquisitive uh, about them. And uh, the community also, parents and the community, become interested in the whole notion of values and the role values play in society. Most people don't know what a value is. Mm. You know, we talk about values. One of the things I ask an audience if I'm giving a presentation, what's a value? They can name a value, but they can't tell you what it is. A value, very simply, is a principle that guides your thinking and behavior. And they come from a variety of sources, your parents, your community, your peer group, your religion, if you're religious, so the society in general. Those, that's the value base you grow on. But they are what drive you. Nobody is values neutral. Often people say, well, I don't do values. Well, if they do, the moment they start talking, you can sense what their values are. So they're the building blocks of our personality, which lead to character. Okay, and so now after the long experience of working with values in schools, we're looking at uh, applying the idea to, again, back to values in business. Lots of people talk about the importance of values. As you say, they put statements mm -hmm. on the wall. Uh, is your interest in this area out of you know, the frustration that that's as far as an understanding of values, generally speaking, goes, except in the case of the most enlightened businesses? Mm. I haven't got sufficient knowledge to make a judgment on, on industry and the business generally. Um, I, I am aware that more and more people are, are contacting me and asking for advice. Uh, I recently gave a, a TED talk uh, and as a result of that I've had some very interesting uh, conversations with people that have seen it and say, well, this should apply to my business, you know, you've made me think in a way that I haven't thought before and I'm starting to apply some of these principles in my business. You've just made me more aware. I wasn't aware of it. Mm. Um, so 
it is become so the first thing is to be values aware in your organization I, I was talking about the the the, the benefits you know uh, self-leadership is probably one of the biggest benefits besides communicative com competence, uh, emotional literacy grows, uh, relational trust. The, the, you become more relational with people and that grows trust in an organization if you are basing it on values. Um, you have to have all your policies. What does values-based mean? It means you base everything in your organization on a set of universal positive human values. Everything you do, your hiring and firing, your policies, the, how your meetings are run, how you interact with colleagues, how you expect everybody to model the values of the company in their interactions with each other, all that becomes values-based. So it's not uh, something you add to an organization as a bolt-on, it is actually the, the uh, whole energy of your business is based on on those values. And the other thing is you don't then leave that in the workplace when you go home at night. Yeah. It will, when you become more conscious, not only positively improves the performance of the workplace, but actually a more conscious person is going to have better relationships in all of their roles in their lives. Yes, uh, that is definitely so. Um, I've often wondered how the person who operates a drone that delivers a, a fatal strike in, in the Middle East uh, on a family, how they then go home at night and interact with their family. Um, it must have a colossal effect, whatever they say. Uh, what we know about the values and what our uh, research and our just anecdotal evidence shows that once you become conscious about values, it has an effect on all aspects of your being. It's not something you do at work, as you're saying, it, it just spreads throughout. So you become much more self-led as a human being uh, because you are, are more relaxed and more authentic because the universal values uh, show are built on our positive qualities. We've got a range of positive qualities that are biologically based, uh, cooperation being one of them. So th the positive values develop those aspects of our personality. And that shadow side of ourselves, which each of us has what I call a shadow, uh, it can come out, our limbic system will, will come out and we, we will defend ourselves when we're needing to defend, we will jump to conclusions, our, our brain is wired up for that. But if you become a values-based organization and are able to have that degree of inward reflection, it then gives you control. May I say a word about reflection? Um, many years ago as a head teacher, I introduced to the children what I called reflection. It's now known as mindfulness and has become a buzzword everywhere. Everyone's doing mindfulness. Mindfulness is moment to moment, non-judgmental awareness. It's bringing the brain into the present moment. Brains are structured to think in the forward and in the past. So a whole part of values-based education is reflective practice. It's what I call developing the wisdom cycle. When something happens to you, you take that moment of pause. Also in businesses, I believe not only do you need tea breaks, but you need brain breaks. Uh, regular brain breaks. They don't take long to have, but it's that pause where you can have a moment to go internal and center yourself and then come out. We know through our experience and research that if you develop those mindfulness techniques, you will have a happier organization and a more productive one. Okay, we're coming towards the end of the session, so I think the, the final thought I've got um, is that being more conscious but aware of values actually reduces the levels of conflict within ourselves. And that's something that we need to be much more conscious of because of the rising levels of you know, mental illness. Mm. It, it's a lack of consciousness that's perhaps leading to 
the, the increase of stress and mental illness and the well we're becoming more and more conflicted in our various different roles yes I think society is imploding uh, at a very alarming rate uh, faster than most people realize I think uh, emotional distress in all its forms is rife in our society uh, the amount of breakdowns in relationships in adult population has never been higher um, children are growing up more and more in dysfunctional homes of once you know many people say oh it doesn't matter if mum and dad break up well come into a school and see the effects of those breakups on the children and I'm sorry if I'm giving people are listening to me uh, uh, a shiver at this point. I don't mean to m make people feel guilty. But all, our, uh, all the effects of society at the moment are having a negative effect on our mental well-being and our ability to relate to each other. The way out of that is to become much more values-based, run your life on a set of values, think about how they mean. As a family, have a meeting Think about the values that you're having as a family and think how they're going to work in the family. Uh, in all sorts of ways, in your company, think how these values actually will work. What simple things, and can I emphasize simple, often businesses and schools, they, they think too, in too complex a way. Usually, many of the answers are very simple. It's, you know, have I said hello to John this, or Mary this afternoon, you know. Otherwise, they think that I'm cross with them or whatever. It's always simple things. How do we build positive relationships, but at the same time are profitable, achieve our results? Because it's not an either or. It's a, a both of those two things. Thanks very much.